surgery systems in the world. And so I always say, you know, if I went and, you know, one of my patients owns the Mercedes-Benz dealership, and when I went to get my car, if I would have paid for a Mercedes-Benz, but I would have performed like a Yugo, I would have been a little bit upset, okay? And that's kind of the situation that's happening in America right now. And the reason that it's people aren't up in arms about it, just like if you bought something and you paid a lot of money for it, but you found out it didn't have the quality that you wanted, you'd be up in arms, wouldn't you? So why is it, I would love your perspective, and by the way, I teach via the Socratic method, so I love to ask questions, and so if we're going to spend the next 45 minutes to an hour together, let's be engaged and decide that we're going to learn something. This is kind of your business too, by the way. So why do you think that people aren't up in arms that we're spending a ton on healthcare in America? And it's really not healthcare, really, it's sick care. Okay, and, and 70%, watch, watch this, 70% of the reasons that people get sick are due to lifestyle causes. That's not me saying that, that's the New England Journal of Medicine. It shows that 70% of the reasons that people get sick are directly related to lifestyle. And so the associated expenses are also related to preventable causes. So why isn't the public up in arms about spending more and more on healthcare and getting less and less in terms of the return on the investment? You want to take a stab at it? Bruce, you want to take a stab at it? Why? Uh, without being political? Um, I, I, you know, I think people have a lot of things to think about and worry about in life, mm -hmm. right? And it's not, it's something, as you said, you said, you know, has come along, like, in steps right. over a period of time. Mm -hmm. And only recently, like, do you, do you really have people starting the conversation? So to me, things like this, and, and there's many more articles now, there's, a, there's conversations, not everybody's acting on it, right. but people know that we need to act on right. it. Now, things like this, like, all right, now give us the steps, right? right. The politicians, so I'll get a little political, we don't talk about that part sure. of it, like actually fixing the health piece a little bit, but not much. We talk about, you know, insurance and those things, right, it kind of after something happens, but how do we now get in front of the game? Absolutely. Right. And it's a really good point, Bruce. Yeah. And I think what Bruce is trying to say, there's there's really no money in healthy people. <laughs> well, yeah. all the money is in the sick people. So the political engine doesn't have an incentive to get people healthy because who's making money on me? Not a lot of people when I'm healthy, right? I'm not having a bypass surgery. I'm not on diabetic medication that's going to cost me 10000 a year. I'm not taking a statin, da 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 So I don't make a lot of people money by being healthy. Okay, so there's there's not a lot of direct incentive to want to change the machine that we've created. The other thing is, what if the um, you know the end user, the actual person who has the healthcare policy, uh, what if they were paying out of pocket every time they had to get on a medication? Uh, what if they, we didn't have something called Medicare, and Medicaid, and, and insurance brokers to to basically pay the bill for somebody's lifestyle? Right. I always found it very interesting that if I'm a safe driver, I get discounts on my insurance, uh, on my on my uh, car insurance. But as a, as a healthy healthcare consumer, not costing my insurance company a lot of money, nobody's writing me a rebate check. And the person who has the same policy as me, who doesn't exercise, eats whatever they want, right, lives a very unhealthy lifestyle, gets the same rate that I get. I just don't see that as necessarily fair. It is what it is. But I, I agree with Bruce. I think the economics of what's going on is really going to force people to take a look and evaluate their behaviors. And if they don't evaluate it, guess what? Their, their employer is going to be evaluating it for in the form of higher co-payments, higher deductibles, disincentives now, which we've never seen. You guys are seeing it now. We're actually disincentivizing people for not being healthy. Okay, does that make sense? And I'm, I'm kind of preaching to the choir, but recognize that when I go out and speak to the normal public, they, they don't know anything about this conversation that we're having right now. So it's kind of a pleasure to speak to you guys about this topic. So the purpose, this isn't the kind of sidetrack, but this isn't the purpose of the, what we're doing. The purpose is to show you what we've created. And over the past 10 years, we've run this program clinically in our office called Eight Weeks to Wellness. And I have to tell you, as a doctor and as a chiropractor, there's, uh, there, I get a, a sense of joy when I see a person change their behavior and really change their life as the result of changing their behavior. Uh, we have, and Teresa can tell you, we have so many patients who have done well, they've lost 40, 50, 60. We have a guy who's lost 140 pounds. We have so many patients that started our program that were diabetics and are no longer diabetics and off their medication. We have so many people that started the program. I know in my heart they were headed for a typical myocardial infarction or a stroke or some sort of cardiovascular event that I think because of what they're doing now are not heading towards that cliff. And so if you're taking notes, I would write this down. It's probably my favorite quote as it pertains to health is Aristotle said that we are what we repeatedly do. Okay? We are what we repeatedly do. So if you really want to know about your health, all you got to do is look what you did today. What did you eat? 
Did you move your body? How did you sleep last night? What kind of medications did you take today? And you're going to know everything you need to know about your health. And it's whether you choose to be reactive or proactive with your health care. I choose to be uh, proactive, so I choose to make deposits into my health savings account. I'm not talking about the HSAs that you guys deal with. I'm talking about my body. And what I find is that because I make deposits, I can make a withdrawal. You know, I try to, my motto, my personal motto is I try to be very disciplined Monday through Friday. You know, I, I try to eat well, I make sure that I exercise, I make sure I get enough sleep. And guess what? My wife and I on Saturday went out with good friends. We had a couple glasses of wine. I had a steak. I wasn't worried about it because Monday through Friday I made a lot of deposits. I didn't mind making a, a withdrawal on Saturday because I had enough reserve capacity in the bank account to handle that. What most people are doing, they're making withdrawals, right? And then on Monday morning when they feel guilty, they make a deposit. And they think that that deposit is going to compensate for all the withdrawals that they're making. Does that make sense to everybody? Yeah. So we created this program, this Eight Weeks to Wellness program, as a way because what I found was not everybody can come to my office and have the time and also have the financial resources to do a scripted program like Eight Weeks to Wellness. So, you know, in, in talking with Amy, I have to thank you guys that uh, Dr. Eric and I, who really worked on this online platform, we've been working on it for about a year, year and a half, we wanted to come up with a solution for a corporation where we can, we call it high tech, high touch, where you've seen the online wellness programs and Amy can show them to me, I'm sure you guys have seen them, but I can tell you something, they don't work, and they don't work because people aren't engaged in them. So again, you are, it's, it's not what you are, what you repeatedly think about. Like Bruce, you said, well, we're now starting to get people to think about this. Well, great, but thinking doesn't change your behavior. Okay, doing changes your behavior. So we've got to go from having these online platforms to actually motiv motivating people to change a habit, right? And that's a very difficult part of this. But I feel this high-tech, high-touch approach where not only is there a high-tech piece where they have all the resources that you're going to learn about now, but there's something that comes along with it. We have over 200 doctors now. We have 51 doctors that practice eight weeks to wellness and another 150 doctors that are involved in an organization that does corporate wellness, corporate wellness education. So the high touch part is developing the relationship with the employee and say, listen, I know what you're going through, you know, just shoot me an email, What's, what are your questions, what are your concerns, so just to take them through that program. So I'm literally going to take you through the uh, program that I would do as if I was going to a corporation and put you guys through the program. At the end, what I'd like to do is show you the online platform because we'll need to get you guys registered for it. Um, there will be homework. I'm not going to pull any punches. If you guys really want to change your health, remember I said it's our way, you are what you repeatedly do. I'm going to script out today that what do you need to do to be healthy? And I, I, and I want to complete honesty in this room. I want you to raise your hand if you feel like you're healthier today than you were five years ago. Honestly. Awesome. I see a lot of hands going up. Good. How about more energy? You have more energy today than you did five years ago? Awesome. Okay. And is that by accident, Bruce, or before, because you've been doing something diff different than you did do five years ago? I think a greater focus. Okay. So a lot of things we've done here brought a lot more focus to me on what I eat, how I eat, how I exercise. Awesome. So, so the, 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 the focus has created the behavior change. It has. Fantastic. Okay, so we're going to dig right into this. Some of this I've already covered with you guys, so I'm not going to spend a lot of time on it. But I do... No, I'm fine. Uh, I do love this quote from the New England Journal of Medicine. It's hard to ignore that in 2006, the United States was number one in terms of healthcare spending per capita, but we ranked 39th for infant mortality, 43rd for female mortality, 42nd for male mortality, 36th for overall life expectancy. And these facts have fueled a question now being discussed in academic circles as well as by the government and the public. Why do we spend so much and get so little? And it's not, it's not only being discussed in academic circles, it's being discussed in corporate circles as well. Okay. These, uh, I, I love this slide too. These were the top uh, 10 health conditions that people took medication for last year. So if you just take a look at the, the problem and then some of the medication, cholesterol, blood pressure medication. And these are the people, I had a woman, new patient today, she was 50, uh, I'm sorry, she was 64 years old. She was taking five prescription medications. That wasn't even including what she was taking over-the-counter medications, five prescriptions. Do you know what it's costing her per year to take those five prescription medications? I bet you it's costing her probably about six, seven thousand dollars a year just for those medications. Okay? And again, I don't have. A, I'm not anti-medicine, guys. I want you guys to know that. If you need a medication, great. But if you're taking a medication to cover up a lifestyle problem that can be solved with a behavior change, we have to ask: Do I lack a medication, or do I lack a new medication? Do I lack a different behavior? All right. So why do you have high cholesterol in the first place? And some people will say to me, "Well, Dr. Dane, my mom had it. My dad had it." So it's genetic. And I say, and then I will pull out a couple of wellness scores and say, see this patient here? Their cholesterol was 210 when they started our program. And now it's down to 173. 
So they could have told me the same thing, that they had a genetic problem. Well, if they had a genetic problem, why in eight weeks did their cholesterol come down 40 points? Does that make sense? So it's not genes, guys. It's how we express our genes through our environment, meaning the genes are just the light switches. You determine what light switches you turn on by your behavior, what you eat, how you move, how you think, how you manage stress, how you sleep, on and on and on. Does that make sense to everybody? So a lot of these medications that we're taking for cholesterol, blood pressure, acid reflux and GERD, diabetes. Do you know that in the majority of diabetes, hopefully you know, is type 2 or adult onset diabetes? And adult onset diabetes is a completely reversible disorder. It, completely reversible. We see it all the time in our practice. So it's, uh, it's, they, they say that it's actually going to overtake in the next 10 years um, the number two and three causes of death, which are cancer and, um, I'm sorry, cancer and uh, I think it's stroke. They say that diabetes is going to become an epidemic, and I think we're seeing that in society right now. So antibiotics, asthma, so you know you can see all this medication, but my point is that a lot of this medication we're taking is due to lifestyle causes. You guys understand that? Mm -hmm. Okay. And, and this, if, if that doesn't get you, this should. Okay? I always say, what about our children? If you take a look in 1971 to 74, this is uh, for ages, let's say, 2 through age 19. So we're talking about toddlers and uh, uh, um, adolescents and teenagers. Okay? So if you take a look, we had about 5 to 6% to of our toddlers and teenagers that were overweight. Okay? Today, and this is from 2003 to 2006, there's no doubt in my mind these statistics have already changed and are worse. But now we're seeing 12 to 17 percent of our teenagers and adolescents and toddlers that are overweight and obese. Has anybody been to a, well, a water park this summer? I was to a water park with my kids and I was just amazed with these little boys that had bellies that hang, hang over their belt. They're little boys. What are these little boys going to grow up? To be grown men with what? Even bigger bellies if they grow up and don't develop heart disease and diabetes. They say, guys, that my kids' generation, I have an 18-year-old and a 14-year-old, they say my kids' generation will be the first generation of Americans that don't outlive their parents. Okay? Now, have our genes and our genetics changed that much in, in my generation? I'll tell you what's changed is our environment. What kids are eating, how they're moving, right, with Xbox and all these things, how they're thinking, the amount of stress that they have to manage. So that, that's a pretty scary thought, and the only way that we're going to be able to change that lifestyle problem is through changing our lifestyle. And what I fi I'm finding is partly what we talked about is kids don't have the time anymore. Nobody talks to them about their posture, what they're eating, exercise, because they have so much on their plate. They don't even talk to them. At least when you were young, at least your, you know, your dad slapped you in the back of the head and told you to stand up straight. Right? <laughs> we, they don't even talk about posture anymore with kids. You know, remember the, the movies with ki kids walking with the books on top of their head? I've never seen a kid in school walk with a book on top of their head. All right? So this, this is kind of troublesome to me as a, as a parent. So your homework, when I tell people when they're doing eight weeks to wellness, I always say your homework, because a lot of people, um, you know, because you don't see it, you're desensitized to it. So if you really want to see a slice of America and what our health has become, I want you to sit and become the greeter for like 15 minutes in Walmart. You don't have to actually greet people, but sit by the little bench there, and I want you to watch America walk through the door. Okay? Because what you're going to see is very you're going to see a 30-year-old riding around a little cart because they can't walk through Walmart. Right? So that's what, that's what America's become, guys. So you have to say, am I willing and am I going to participate in that system? I've just chosen not to become another statistic and to live my life differently. Okay? This is Dr. Amy Harvey. Maybe some of you ladies um, see Dr. Amy. She's an OBGYN in Bucks County here. Um, and just to show you that our program works, you can see Amy when she started the program and, and then Amy when she completed the program. And so, you know, you, sometimes you hear that um, chiropractors and medical doctors don't work really well together, and it's just not true. I have a lot of med medical doctors who've actually been through our program, and I believe that, you know, all the word doctor means teacher. So it actually comes from a Latin word that means teacher. So I have a problem with doctors that don't teach their patients how to live a healthy lifestyle. Somebody comes in with high cholesterol and they throw them on a statin without even mentioning the word diet or giving them advice and counsel on how to change. Matter of fact, I think it's irresponsible if a doctor doesn't counsel a person on how to change their behaviors because they're not doing a, what, what I would consider as good doctoring, is teaching their patients as well as treating their patients. Okay? This is Jim O'Malley. Like I said, Jim's an interesting uh, uh, case. Jim came to me in, in 2008 when the Phillies won the World Series. He's a huge Phillies fan. And I sat down with him and he saw, he had had um, uh, another patient of ours who did it, we still who did real well. 
referred him to the office. And so I sit down with him, and he, he uh, you know, obviously he was overweight, and we started talking, and he told me a story about his dad. His dad was 59 years old, and his dad's ambulance was hit on the way to dialysis. And because he had lost his legs because uh, of, he had diabetic neuropathy, so he had been amputate, uh, amputated uh, at his legs because of his diabetes, he was ejected from the ambulance because they couldn't seatbelt him down, okay? And he was killed. And so that left an impression. He always said to me that diabetes indirectly killed my father. He was 59 years old. And he was not bound for a long life anyway. And Jim didn't want to be in that category. Jim was 32 years old at the time when he came into our office. And he was, didn't even know it, but he was already a diabetic when he ran his blood work, okay? Severely overweight, problem, problem, problem. Sits all day long at a computer. Maybe you guys, some, some of you guys uh, can identify with that. Doesn't get any exercise. So Jim's been through the program many times. He continues to live the lifestyle that we've advocated. He just had his first child about a year ago. And as a doctor, I can tell you, I feel really good about this guy living a long, healthy lifestyle. I don't know about this guy living a long, healthy lifestyle. So now you know why I love my job so much. And by the way, Bruce hit on it, you've got to inspire people to make a change. You know, and sometimes that's, you know, I say the word love is a two-part word. It's supporting people, but it's also challenging people. You know, when people come into my office, my job is not to be their friend. My job is to be their doctor. And if I see they're participating or engaging in behavior that's going to shorten their life, or at, at, while they're on this earth, the quality of their life is not going to be what, what it should be, it's my job to say something to them, okay? Um, we do wellness scores on all our patients, guys, and I would encourage you guys to get the same. We can look at data, and data doesn't lie. You know, when I look at a person's physiology, you can't BS your way out of your BMI. You can't BS your way out of your body composition. Your numbers are what they are, and if they're not good, if your cholesterol is not good, then we need to talk about how we're going to change it. If your BMI isn't good, we need to talk about how to change it. If your waist measured, if your functional movement screen, all the things that we do with our patients, that's my first assessment to find out where you're starting from. And here's what I know. Everybody has the ability to improve their health. It's just you got to find out where you're starting from and where your deficits are. Like some people, their general health is really good, but their structural health is bad. Some people, their structural health is really good, but their general health is, is really bad. So we take a look at the numbers to find out where our patients are. In the corporate wellness program that we're doing, guys, the big ones are BMI, waist measurement, blood pressure. Uh, we work with uh, LabCorp, and LabCorp we have a corporate contact, a contract with where we can bring them in and they can do a laboratory assessment on our, um, on our corporations as well. You know, we'll have our biometric screening results mid-February. So and what do you do with your biometrics? Which biometrics do you do? Uh, it's a 27-panel blood draw. It's nice. liver, kidneys. And everybody in here has it done? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah it's nice. a Cadillac. Do I get to look at it? Well, if, and for anyone that's interested in participating in this program, we would yeah. use that as okay. the basis. And so we're not, you know, <clears throat> It's awesome. So what we do, guys, is, is what I find is a lot of corporations do these biometric uh, assessments, but then there's no follow-up. You know, so it's it's great to find out that somebody's a D in their biometric assessment, but then what do you do about the D, right? So we take a look in these red areas like glucose. This is a great example because this woman, she was uh, about 24 years old when she started the program, and she was not very heavy. You see, she's uh, uh, five foot two. And she was, uh, I'm sorry. Five foot four, and she was 140 pounds. Her BMI was just a little bit over 24, 25. If you looked at her, you wouldn't think that this is a woman that needed to lose weight because she didn't. But what she needed to do was get healthy. If you look at some of her numbers, her glucose was way off the charts, and her insulin. This is what your body produces in response to sugar. This was about seven times higher than it should be. So she was eating so much sugar, and her body was cranking out so much insulin to to get her blood uh, glucose down, and it wasn't even bringing it down that much. She was, she was on an antidepressant, okay? She was on a couple different medications because her glucose and her insulin and her diet were horrible. Even though she looked, looked okay, on the inside, when we opened up the hood and took a look inside, she was a very unhealthy person. And she went through eight weeks to wellness. And you can see her insulin went from 26.7 in eight weeks and went to four, right? And these are some of the things that we look at. In addition to looking at glucose, we need to kind of look a little bit deeper under the hood because you can have great glucose but your pancreas is cranking out five times as much insulin to bring it down to normal levels. That's a person who's going to burn up that pancreas in a short period of time. Okay? It's the difference between structural health and general health. Exactly. And what do you mean by that? What's the difference? difference? Oh, awesome. no. um, the difference between structural and general health is we look at four categories. We look at general health, structural health, biochemical health, and usually mental emotional health. So structural would be more what you think about, the physical health, somebody's posture, their functional movement screen, their strength. 
And then more general health is BMI, waist measurement, blood pressure. More general parameters where structure are more meant for movement-based assessments. Does that make sense? Okay. Uh, and then obviously the goal, guys, is to change habits. So it's the why, how, and the what. And we start from the bottom up. Because if you don't have a big enough why or why you want to get healthy, then it's probably not going to happen. I, I'll tell you my why. I have two children. I'd love to see my children grow up and not be a burden on them. Because I see my patients are a burden on their children when they get older. They're a burden financially, and they're a burden, burden in terms of productivity. I'd like to be a blessing in my kids' life. I'd like to be able to do whatever I want with my grandkids, right, physically, emotionally. I'd like to financially have a, enough wealth to help my kids out. Do you understand? I think about that. What do I want to look like? And I think sometimes we disconnect with what we really, uh, what we really look like. It's amazing when I show people their postural pictures, and we, with the guys we have them take their shirts off so I can assess their posture and take their picture. I obviously don't do that with the women. You know, I don't like lawsuits. So, <laughs> but we, we can get a real assessment. And a lot of times when I hand the guy the picture, the report of his posture, he's not looking at his posture. He's looking at what, what's hanging over his belt, right? And I can see that he stops and he stares at it for a minute because he doesn't believe that it's him. So we kind of, we, we're desensitized with the way we really look. And I would say if you really want to get a good glimpse of yourself, tonight, like, you know, get down to your skivvies and look at yourself in the mirror. Turn to the side and look at yourself in the mirror because what's staring back at you is reality. And although you may not like it, it's the emotion that's going to drive you to make a change. So what's, the, what's your why? I don't know what your why is, but what I'm saying is unless you have a big enough why, and it can't be just because you want to lose weight for your daughter's wedding, because your daughter's wedding will come and go, and then what's your why? Right? Your why has to be more longer term. And I think thinking into the future, what do you want to age like? What do you want to look like? What do you want to do functionally? You know, some of you guys, you know, you come to a meeting like this, you can't even hold your eyes open, right? Because you're so tired, you don't have the energy. And energy is a biomarker of health. If you don't have energy, guess what? You're, you're not a healthy person. The word energy means the capacity to do work. That's the physics term for energy, the capacity to do work. If you don't have energy, guess what? You're not getting a lot done in your daily, um, in your requirement. We call it presenteeism. You've heard of that term. It's not only the ability to come to work, but it's the ability to be present and be productive. Okay? So the why, how, and the what, and that's what we're going to go over right now. Okay? Remember I said love equals support and challenge? Okay? If you're my family member or you're my patient, I'm not only going to support you, but I'm going to challenge you in your health behaviors. Okay? And so we talked about this. I love this term. You know, the idea is to die young as late as possible, right? And making regular deposits in a health savings account. So you're, I'm going to ask you in doing this program, I'm going to ask you for 5% of your time per week. Okay? A week con is, consists of how many hours? Has anybody ever done the math? 24 times 7? I've done the math. It's 168 hours. Let's say you sleep 7, 8 hours a, a night. You're roughly talking about 105, 110 waking hours that you have every single week. You're not getting more, you're not getting less. You have 105. I'm going to ask you for about 3 to 5 hours of your time to commit to the most important resource that you have. That's you. Somebody else tell me something important in your life. Amy, tell me something important in your life, as if I don't already know. But tell me anyway. My kids. Your kids. Okay. I knew she was going to say that. She didn't say it. I already <laughs> shared kids. They all pull on saying kids. Somebody else tell me something other than your kids. Your husband. <laughs> awesome. Tell me you said that. Somebody else tell me something. Work. So, work. Thanks, Bruce. My work's important to me, too. You know, uh, your dogs, your, your mom. You know, it could be a lot of things. Maybe you have a social cause. But here's what I can tell you. You don't do your husband, your kids, your wife, your work any good if you're not healthy. Because when you're unhealthy, who's the person that you're thinking about? When you're, when you're sick and you don't feel good, who are you thinking about? Yourself. Yourself. You're not thinking about anybody else. And so what I can tell you, when you're healthy and you have energy and you feel great, it gives you the ability to think about other people and help other people. Does that make sense to everybody? Okay? So this is, I'm asking you for time, but I'm asking you for time to invest back into the most important resource you own, which is you. And when you invest that time back into yourself, it's like people running around driving their car saying, I don't have time to get gas. It's the most asinine thing that I've ever, I don't have time to stop to get gas. <laughs> well, you know what? That's why you run out of gas. Okay? So chiropractic, and, and I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this, but I'm a chiropractor, so I have to talk about it. And one thing I want people to know is you live your life through the nervous system. Everything that happens in your body is processed through your nervous system. You see, you feel, you hear, you're animated to move because of your nervous system. And most people think that chiropractors are, are doctors who fix back pain. And that's not why we work with you. We, we work with you because from your brain down to the rest of your body, you have these things called nerves. And your nerve is the AT&T of your body. So if your brain's trying to talk to your body, 
and it, it hurts my hand over my mouth and I can't communicate, that's what interference to the nervous system does. And I look at x-rays and MRIs all day long, and people who sit, and people who have been through trauma, we see a, a tremendous amount of damage in the spine due to what we call subluxation or just misalignment. So it's like a cavity, uh, you know, a dentist look at, looks at cavities, and, and cavities may be common, but they're not normal. Does everybody understand the difference? There's a difference between common and normal. <laughs> so I see a lot of back issues, subluxations, that may be common, but they're not normal. Okay. The other thing I love about chiropractic is we tend to be more proactive. We tend to be more wellness-based. Okay? If you go to the average chiropractor, they're going to be talking about your diet. You know, they're going to be talking about movement, getting up out of your chair. All right? So exercise. Let's talk about this. We built this into the program, and so the exercise is going to be in modules per week. So you're going to download your exercise, and here's what we're going to ask you. We're going to ask you for three 20-minute cardio sessions, but you're going to be doing it in interval fashion. This is really important with cardio. How many people have done some form of cardiovascular activity in the past week? Okay? Here's the, here's the key, guys, and this is the key. You can do three 20-minute cardio sessions a week. That's one hour of cardio and get more benefit than somebody who's doing five one-hour cardio sessions. Okay? You want to save time? Here's how you do it. You've got to ramp your heart rate up and down. If you get done your cardio and you're not sweating, you haven't done good cardio. Some of you, I could get you sweating walking you around this building twice. Some of you, we could sprint to my office and you may not be sweating. So everybody has a different capacity for their aerobic conditioning, but you've got to ramp that heart rate up and down. Now, how do we do that? On a treadmill, we may increase our, our speed. We may increase our angle and our resistance. But we can always alter that. Some people say, well, I can't run on a treadmill. Well, then increase your angle on your treadmill. Hold weights when you're walking in your treadmill. Same thing with your bike. Increase your resistance. So you want to, what I do, for example, when I'm on a treadmill, I'll start at like 4.2 miles an hour, which is a fast walk. And I'll ramp up to about 9 miles an hour, which for me is a, is a quick sprint. So every minute, I'm increasing about a half a mile an hour until I get up to 9, then I back it back down to about 5. And then every minute, I ramp back up to 9, and I do that for 20 minutes. When I get done, I'm sweating my butt off. But 20 minutes, I've gotten more accomplished than a lot of people that are doing hour at a steady pace, where they're just walking at 4.2 miles an hour. So always do your cardio, ramp your heart rate up and down. And the reason for that is we don't live life in a box. There's going to be times that you are running for the bus. There's going to be times that you're sitting in a chair, your heart rate is real low. So you want your heart to be able to work in all parameters and dimensions of motion, not just one parameter. Does that make sense? The other thing, for, especially for you ladies, no decline with age is dramatic or potentially more significant than the decline in lean body mass. And Amy, what's lean body mass? Have I taught you what lean body mass is? It's muscle. It's muscle. If you don't have muscle on your body, uh, listen to this, a pound of muscle burns seven times more calories than a pound of body fat. And a pound of body fat takes up twice as much room as a pound of muscle. So a pound of fat takes up twice as much room but burns seven times less calories. So you want your metabolism to be high. How many women in here would like a high metabolism so you can eat more? Raise your hand. Men, same thing? You better keep muscle on your body. And Bruce, what's the only way to keep muscle on your body? I see Bruce working out in my gym. It's the resistance training, yeah. right? You've got to do something against resistance. For some of you, your body weight is plenty of resistance, trust me, okay? For some of you, you may need more resistance, like cables and weights and things like that, but that's what you got to do. It could be calisthenics, push-ups, pull-ups, that kind of stuff, but it's got to be weighted against resistance. And I got all of us up, and we did 50 squats. Some of you wouldn't be able to get out of your chairs tomorrow morning because your legs would hurt so bad. That's just using your body weight. Does that make sense? Okay. So we want to do 30 minutes of exercise, and that's going to decrease your chances of cancer by 50%. So think about this. If I made a pill, and I told you this pill decreases chances of all cancers by 50%, would you take that pill? You'd probably take it even if it was expensive. Well, I've got the pill for you guys. It's called exercise. Okay? It doesn't cost you anything. Well, it may cost you for your gym membership. Okay? We talked about this, guys. You're responsible to do three 20 to 30 minute cardio sessions. We're going to be ramping that heart rate up and down during the 20 minutes. And by the way, everybody today is going to get a buddy pass. It's a free workout at my office. We have a functional training facility. So if you don't know how to do this, come over. You've got a free sample to come over and work with one of our trainers to teach you how to do what I'm, I'm talking. Now, I hate this picture. My sister put this in the presentation because <laughs> she has bigger arms than me. Okay? And this is from like the 1980s when you, people wore these kind of things. So you'll rarely find me in a shirt like that anymore. So you get a three to one and turn on your investment. What I mean by that is when you do resistance training, not only do you burn calories while you're exercising, but it takes your body time to repair and build that muscle back up again, and you're actually burning calories. And when you put the muscle on your body, your metabolism goes up and you're burning calories then. 
I can eat, I could increase my caloric intake, guys, this week, 2,000 calories a day, I wouldn't gain that much weight. Why? Because my metabolism goes so fast, I chew it up. Where if you guys eat, you know, an extra uh, piece of spaghetti, it goes right to your waist or your hips, okay? So you will be sore. If you're doing exercise properly, guys, you should be sore. And at the end, what I'll do is I'll go into the Amy Smalls Challenge site and show you how to use this. Um, Amy knows about these. These are fitness trackers. We recommend heart rate monitors because your heart rate monitor, again, I'm a data guy. If you tell me you're exercising hard and I ask you what your heart rate is and you tell me it's 90, I'm going to look at you and tell you you're not exercising that hard. Okay? People do this. They are confidently wrong. Have you ever noticed that? You know? They're, they're, they're wrong, but they're confident about it. You know? It's like saying people come in all the time and they think they're really, really healthy. And I show them their wellness score, I'm like, well, you're kind of an F, you know, and I, last time I was at school and the F is not that good, right? So it's, you know, and I also see the opposite. I see people come in and they think that they're really, really sick and they're not that bad. So the data to me is what you need to know whether you're working out properly. And your heart rate monitors, they also have, how many of you guys have heard of the Fitbit? Fitbit tracks your kind of caloric, your steps and your uh, amount of calories burned per day. So these are great resources. Massage. You know, I always say massage is not a luxury, it's a necessity. You know, so if you do get massage, you should communicate with your um, therapist. A lot of you guys sit all day long, so I could go around this room and start touching your traps and your shoulders. I guarantee you're going to be tight there, because the human body isn't designed to sit. Anybody see me on CBS Friday morning? I do a monthly uh, health segment. I'll have Amy um, send it to you guys. But it was all in the, the perils of sitting, because it's only in the past 50 years that 70% of us are sitting for a living. And let me tell you, it's really wrecking our health because it's, again, we don't put on muscle when we're sitting. It's pressure on the lower back and shoulders. We're just not designed to sit. So we talk about that. So massage is just a nice way to kind of get your body and uh, blood flow to those muscles. Meditation. On the program, I'll show you, there's going to be a resource for you to do 10 minutes of daily meditation. Now, I want you guys to do this in some uh, way. I think this is the most important part. And the people that tell me they don't have time to meditate are the people that need it the most. Okay, 10 minutes a day to quiet your mind. And if you, you tell me, I don't have 10 minutes a day to quiet my mind and rest my mind, I always say meditation is a time when you stop thinking and you're thought through. Does anybody like, like me, that like you have a problem and the, the solution to the problem comes to you in the middle of the night, can't remember somebody's name or you're, you're thinking about something, and all of a sudden you wake up in the middle of the night, ah, yeah, that's it. You know why you had that? Because you stopped thinking, right? And meditation is a way to stop thinking and start being thought through. Because whether you know it or not, there's a higher intelligence in this world. Whether you want to call it God, Buddha, Mother Nature, I don't care what you call it. I just want you to know it's smarter than you are. Okay? And there's a lot of intelligent people in this room. But guess what? You, didn't, you could make a blade of grass if I asked you to, could you? You could make one human cell. And there's an intelligence out there that's animating this world and that created you. And all I'm asking you to do is get in touch with that. Because maybe it has some really good wisdom to share with you if you'd stop talking long enough in your mind to listen to it. That makes sense to everybody? Ten minutes a day, and I'll show you in the um, website where we've created that. All right, we're, we're almost done here, guys. Nutrition. No? Nope. You have to think greater than how you feel. Okay? That's what I said. You've got to think greater than how you feel. There's going to be times, especially with nutrition, where you feel like doing something. But you've got to think greater than how you feel. You may want that ice cream and sit and watch TV, but you've got to think better in the evening and script out something, get leverage on yourself. So my, and I'll give you an example, my worst time when I'm going to screw up is in the evening. Around 8, 9 o'clock before I go to bed, I sit on the couch, turn on the biggest loser. It's funny, you know, I'll turn on the biggest loser and grab some ice cream. I mean, how, how perverted is that, right? I'm watching these people exercise, like, man, they are really busting their butts. <laughs> Anybody else do that or is it just me? Okay, maybe, maybe I have a problem. But, uh, but, but what I'm saying is that, you know, now what I do is I go up and I go to the bedroom. Because if I watch TV by the kitchen... I'm only an arm's length away from the freezer where there's ice cream in there. So if I go upstairs, then I gotta walk all the way downstairs to get, you know, ice cream, it's a lot easier for me. So you've got to outsmart yourself. You know, I always tell my wife, honey, don't buy it. If you buy it, I'll eat it. Okay, so please don't buy it. I like chocolate, nuts, anything like that, ice cream. Cookies and cream, no problem. Okay, but if there's if there's chocolate nuts in it, it's going down if it's in my freezer, right? I'm a human being just like everybody else. So remember, food is a mixture of carbohydrate, fat, and protein. And this is pretty basic information, guys, so I'm going to fly through this. Because all of this is in the website. What we're trying to do on this program is so simple. We're just trying to keep your blood sugar under control. The reason that we're overweight in this country, guys, is not because we eat too much fat. It's because we eat way too many grains and carbohydrates. 
and grains, carbohydrates, anything that's in box bag, bags uh, has a lot of sugar in it. And it's processed. So what it means is that we were designed to eat fruits and vegetables as our main source of carbohydrates. Is there any bread trees? Is any bread, does bread grow on trees? Okay. Does cereal, do you forage for cereal in the, in the forest? Is that where you get your cereal from? No. You get it out of a package in a bag and it's been processed. They process the fiber out of it, they process the nutrients out of it, and it jacks up your insulin levels. And does anybody know why we secrete insulin? Anybody know why we secrete insulin? It's to drive our blood sugar down.